Oh, actually. Um, can I have y'all start recording locally as well? Just a start with this. All right, let's do the... Uh, let me make sure I have local recording going. So we should be live on the YouTube, so careful what you say now. <laughs> sure. Uh, all right, so let me make sure... I've got myself a local recording. Test one, two, three. I see bars. And I see kilobytes. Awesome. Bars and kilobytes. Okay, so you know we're uh, we're gonna play the, the the themes. You're not gonna rob our our audience of uh, of that 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 fancy tune. Um, you know we have um, shows. Do you want to do uh -huh. a sync clap before that? Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I always forget that. So All right. I sent so... it to you in a Slack. I have like a little checklist that I have to go through because otherwise I forget stuff. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Although it's not entirely accurate because some of the tweeting and stuff isn't as necessary sometimes. Like I think Jared does some of that now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, let me take a quick look through a chess checklist. Make sure I didn't forget anything. All right, mm -hmm. we got this. All right, we got that. We've gone live on the uh, soundboard. I don't even know if I have the sync clap on there, do I? I don't. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's good that you mentioned it. Um, yeah, it should add that. Cool. Um, yeah, we should save that on the, um, on our on our GoTime channel as well. Um, all right. So uh, so just to make to make sure we all synced up in the counting, you know, I'm gonna do one, two, three, and then four. Right? One, two, three, four. Okay. All right. Ready? One, two, three. All right. Mine's still gonna be quiet, so Jared's gonna have to deal with that. Ah, that's Jared's problem now. <laughs> I mean, I'm at least in a brace now. The first time I did it with Matt, like a while back, I had a cast on my hand still, and I'm like, I, uh -oh. I can't, I can't clap right now. It's <laughs> not gonna happen. That. Oh yeah, he'll he'll figure it out. He he knows how we do at this point. All right, let's get let's get this show on the road. Let's do it. It's go time. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of GoTime, where we get to talk about immutable databases. Now, I must admit, I'm going to be a skeptic during this show because, because I've, been, I've been looking for, for um, use cases, right? And, and you know, the project that we're going to be talking about does a very good job of sort of articulating those things. But I'm still very much old school, if you can call it that, right? Um, the concept of immutable databases has been, it's not something I've ever had to use at work. So I'm looking to, well, let me take that back. I'm not going to be a skeptic. I'm going to I'm gonna approach this with an open mind and, and I'm going to approach it as, as a learner, right? As a beginner to this space and to this, to this kind of technology, okay? Joining me today, all right, is my co-host, John Calhoun. Say hi, John. Hey, Johnny. How are you? I'm good, man. We haven't been on a podcast together for like a couple of months at least. It's been a little while. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. Glad to have you with me here today. Also joining me are two. Um, I don't want to say. I don't know if it's if it's co-founders or core contributors or all of the above. But the two of you work um, uh, on the uh, Code Notary team, um, and I did a quick uh, a Google around and see and see that's actually a company that actually. Um, has a product that they're selling, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the open source project that the, that the team is behind called uh, uh, EmuDB, right? Um, joining me to talk about the, this project are the folks who work on it um, all the time, right? Uh, I've got uh, Bart uh, Sienski, who is a, a software engineer uh, and passion, he's passionate about the cryptography and, and applied math. And, and open source, and he's been um, working on, on sort of in UDB uh, since last year, since you know last year, um, and obviously he's been using Go to do that. So we're going to be peeling back uh, on that onion to figure out you know what makes you Go such a good tool for this particular kind of technology. Also joining uh, Bart is uh, Hieronimo Irazabal. So 
uh, Hieronimo also works um, uh, at the Code Notary um, on the team that uh, works on ImmuDB. Um, and uh, he's a software engineer, also passionate about cryptography and database. I'm seeing a theme here. Um, and uh, and uh, also he's been uh, working on uh, on uh, ImmuDB actually a little bit longer um, since the year before, since July 2020, um, on this particular project. And I'm also interested in hearing what your journey has been using Go for, to build these kinds of things. All right. So welcome, Bart, and welcome, Hieronimo. Hi. Uh, me. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So. Ah, where do we start? Um, first of all, uh, uh, um, I think our audience, um, not everybody is going to be familiar with the concept, right? We, we, we all sort of share a common understanding for being application developers, you know, writing business applications and whatnot. We all have a pretty sort of um, common understanding of your database, right? You write things in and you update records and when you need to, you delete things. Uh, so it, it's, it's almost like a it's a tool for transactions, right? You record things in there, and when something's you know, uh, um, no longer needed, you delete it. Um, sometimes you might need to update it, but at any given time, the state of the data within the database is shifting, right? Um, and in comes this concept of an immutable uh, uh, database, and to which I'm scratching my head, I'm thinking, okay, what use case, like what is an immutable, why would I want my database to be immutable? So please, Let's start with you, Bart. Why don't you tell me what an immutable database is? Uh, yeah, so when you have some information, right, you put them in, inside your database, uh, usually we tend, tend to think that this is some kind of temporal state. We can change this, alter this after some time. But what if actually there is some information that you don't want to change? And, and that's where the immutability comes into play. So maybe there are some informations like critical things like maybe transactions on your account um, or some records that uh, let's say you, you uh, write down the temperature on your room. This is not going to change in the future. So that's where the data itself is immutable and immutable databases try to work with this kind of information, right? So um, with the information that won't be altered or uh, maybe a different way, Sometimes the data can be altered, but some properties of this information should not be changed, like the history of the values. If you want to scan over the whole history of the values and you maybe have a use case where you have to look back what was the state over time, this history will not change. So that's also a property that maybe you want to keep immutable. And uh, also uh, the database, maybe you want to have a, an extra layer of protection from the database so that you don't accidentally uh, change and damage this information. And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I remember when I was working on some standard da databases, this common database, you know, there's this feeling when you do delete too much records from the database and suddenly you feel that, oh, oh how can I get out of this situation? <laughs> and, and immutability here helps a lot, mm -hmm, keeps mm -hmm. you this peace of mind, but there's also much more to it. Yeah. Right, right. So let me let me let me try to sort of state that back to you, but but basically based on the way I understand it. So what we're when we're talking about immutable data, right? Let's just remove the database aspect of it for a second. When we talk about immutable data, we're talking about what is the state of things? What is the reality of things right now? At the time I choose to record this data, be it on a piece of paper uh, or electronically in a database, whatever, right? What is the state of the world right now at the time I'm writing this piece of data? So if, if currently it is uh, 50 degrees uh, Fahrenheit uh, at this hour, this minute, right? Um, after, you know, in, in another hour, right? If the temperature rises by 10 degrees and now it's not 60 degrees, Right, the, the you're not changing the past. You're not changing when it was 50. You know, you're you're basically adding a new record, saying, okay, another another snapshot of this of this data. You know, means that at this hour now it is this 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 temperature. So, you're you're it's almost like you're dealing with sort of an append only logging kind of kind of kind of situation where, where at any given time. You're, you're able to sort of go back in history to figure out what was the state of the world at this particular time, this particular point in time. But for, which is, I can see why sort of a, this creates some sort of a, a trail, a log, auditability, that kind of things, and see, okay, well, how is this thing changing over time? Who changed it? You know, why, whatever, right? Um, but the, the, 
as they are the so that applies to a particular use case whereby in in most um cases what i'm used to is give me the current temperature right whether i ask for that you know uh, an hour ago or an hour from now i'm asking for the current temperature give me the current temperature so what you're tracking behind the scenes multiple versions of it that's kind of your business but sometimes i just want whatever the current value however you determine that i want whatever the current value is right so those are slightly different use cases so it seems to me that immutable da databases are about keeping a, a history of things right not about sort of being your your sort of a, um your pro almost like a, your primary database like if i'm building a weather app right i may want to see right what the historical value is but if we change that a little bit and add, say, say uh, um, a financial services app or something, that make, make an app for a bank, for example, right? When I can see the my account balance over time, and every time this entry was was sort of a um, every time my my account is changed, right? You know, maybe a new purchase or a debit or some sort of deposit, I'm tracking that over time. But at any given time, I want to know what's my current balance. Can I buy this thing or not, right? So it seems like there are multiple, there are different use cases. One, one is not supposed to replace the other. Do, do I understand this correctly? Yes, in, in a sense, okay. yes. Mm, so basically this immutable database is like a watcher over time, but it also contains the most recent state. Like if you want to check the balance, your current balance, it will still be inside this database. So there is still a use case. Um, as a primary source, source of information, but it's it's actually more about uh, pro protection against some kind of tampering with the history. So uh, if you want to change to make sure that the current balance is the true information, how can you be sure that someone did not do some kind of uh, change in the history, alter the data? How can you be sure that uh, the current state is actually valid? Because let's say that there's Let's let's have a use case where uh, there is a banking application, like a simplified use case, and there is a user. If you want to check your current balance, you open this application, check the balance, then you do some purchases, and then you check the balance again. So uh, you intuitively check if this thing match, right? So if the previous state, the previous balance, and the price that you have to pay, if this all matches. If it doesn't match, you start being suspicious. Something is wrong. And immutability also and verifiability uh, can be used to actually uh, make sure that uh, not only the user can do this. So you remember the, the old state, you know the current state, and you can mm -hmm. somehow check if, if this is consistent. And immutability here, and especially in ImmediaDB, gives you tools, cryptographical tools, to make sure that actually the database did not lie to you. So once something was written in history, the database cannot say that oh, you know, it was something different. It cannot lie to you because if it would lie, then you will immediately see this because of this mathematical proof. So if there's something crucial like uh, audit logs, which uh, after some time, uh, you may want to do some investigation what happened over time, this gives ask extra protection, but you can rely on this information because database has proven that up to till this point in time, it is consistent with the whole history. Okay. May I okay. jump in? Yep. Okay. So I, I think you were covering a lot of uh, uh, problems by immutable data. Uh, first, I would like to clarify, uh, I think immutability is an overloaded term because as uh, Shani, you were mentioning, uh, with immutability, we usually refer to systems or data structures that are append only, that treat changes or updates are, as a new data, actually. So when we are doing an update of a record, we, we are not mutating the original record, but uh, treating the update as a new record describing the change. So we, we are used to that for immutability. And actually, ImmuDB, relies on every, every component in ImmoDB is an append only data structure. Uh, even the cryptographic data structure are treated as append only. But in immutable, immutability in databases or even in blockchain, we tend to refer to another thing, not, not just to uh, append only, 
but to the possibility to to verify that the history hasn't changed. Uh, so every record is registered and, and cryptographic linked to what happened before. And then you have a way to verify if a given transaction or a given record uh, was present and was not modified anymore once it was written. This doesn't mean that you cannot have the current state of your balance account. And, and as a traditional database, you will have either as the current, the latest value that was placed for a given record, because the record could be the key that identify the address or, or the balance. Um, but also, depending on the use case, it may be a cumulative set of changes, like in, in Git, where we, we are committing changes. But so the state or the history, um, it's independent of that. What we refer to type of uh, things is verifiable. I, I prefer the term verifiable database uh, rather than immutable verifi uh, immutable database mm -hmm. because you can think of uh, every system checks, right? Internal integrity checks to, to check the consistency uh, of a given record or if, of a given file if it was uh, consistently. Uh, con is consistent or not. But with tampering detection, it's like giving the possibility to the client application or the application that is using the database to do their integrity ver validation by themselves. That is one of the difference. Is the application that is con received database who is able to run the integrity check to validate that the data that was received was not modified since it was written okay let's 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 pull on that thread a little bit so we're not talking about the clients um sort of being or maintaining a copy of whatever data you might have at a central sort of immutable database or a verifiable database right you're talking about some some sort of a cryptographic verifiability right of the data okay. exactly so one of the particularities of an immutable database is that at every moment, the complete state of the database is captured by a hash, hash value. So that denotes not only the current state, but what the complete history of changes up to that point. So the class in, in, in ImmuDB, for instance, or in other immutable databases, is uh, the client who needs to keep track of this current state the latest state that, that is known is like in the example that were mentioned balance uh, bank balance account you may know what was the latest state and that you can trust right and mm -hmm. based on that and the new changes is where you can compare you have the base to compare the new changes or the new results and and, and so on so but the client only need to keep track uh, the, the state of the database at any given point. That is the minimal information. So to make sure I understand this, that means that deleting records also isn't permissible? Is that true? So deletion is actually depending, we have two labels. Uh, we have logical deletion or physical deletion. Logical deletion is something that can be handled by the application or by the server. But it, it, the difference in terms of performance because the filtering out of the information will be done much faster if it's done directly by the, the database. We, in ImmoDB, we currently have support for logical deletion in both manners, like deleting a key, for instance, or by providing an expiration date. But this currently is just a logical deletion. This, the, this means the data will be still there. It will be automatically filtered out. Um, and the client won't receive it, but it's not yet uh, physically deleted. And we have discussions uh, to, to incorporate physical deletion of data. Uh, and it's a very, very interesting topic to discuss what involves the physically deleting the data uh, and, and being, yet being able to prove. So depending on the data you delete or you remove is the possibility you have later on to build proof. So it's a very, very interesting topic. Yeah. And I, like, I'm assuming we're going to want to talk about good use cases for an immutable database. Mm -hmm. But I guess the first thing that comes to my mind is 
I feel like you'd have to be careful as to what applications you use this for because there are like rules like GDPR where you have to be able to forget people essentially. Mm -hmm. And I could imagine a weird situation where you write something to an immutable database accidentally and then realize like, how do we fix this? Yeah, and actually uh, GDPR is the main reason why we started actually thinking about physical deletion because uh, some uh, laws uh, make sh uh, require from you to make sure that data is not accessible at all after some time. Of course, the rules are not clear because sometimes uh, you have to hide the data from the users, but then you have to keep it for a longer time because there may be some kind of investigation later on. Um, but still, uh, it may it is possible to actually remove the data and and maybe there is a different reason for that because if you have append only structure append only data and you start putting too much data into it you it will just run out of space and after sometimes you want to reclaim maybe this space or or you have the physical constraints of your server and you have to deal with that and there is a production system running so maybe you want to just wipe data that was longer at, after so uh, longer uh, that is older than some po point in time in the, in the past and uh, you know uh, and still the state as Hieronimo said the state of the database the hash of the database contains all the history so mm -hmm. this is very interesting topic so you don't you no longer have the data but the state uh, needs to uh, calculate this delta the data in so that you can still prove that the new changes added to the database are consistent with the whole history since the beginning. Mm -hmm. Regarding use case, and uh, a few months ago, there was a situation with a famous uh, tennis player and the COVID-19 results. And there was some news regarding multiple uh, results depending on when it was queried uh, from, from the service. And if that, of course, if that data is stored in immutable databases, or in blockchain, then it will be possible to actually know if that data was consistent or was tampered with. That is a kind of use case in a more uh, traditional system of service that it may take time uh, to, to use a tradition, a immutability, immutable database in this type of system or service, but I, I'm sure it, it will happen with time. So it's, it's not about just uh, sensitive information like uh, well in this case was health but... mm -hmm. so it sounds like of the use cases you know some obvious ones are you know obviously financial transactions you know health records and and things that basically you care about that basically change over time you want to be able to go back at some point and says hey what was the state of things on this date right but and, and be be uh, have a high degree of confidence that they, this data hasn't been altered hasn't been modified or anything like that that's 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 the key takeaway here from from what i'm getting from what i'm gathering exactly. okay okay so what I'm curious, what drives folks like you into this particular domain problem? Why immutable databases? <laughs> of all the things you could be working on. Yeah. yeah, I think we both say that we like playing with cryptography and math. Mm -hmm. for, for me personally, when I start learning about ImmuDB and what techniques it uses, you know, the cryptography itself and the mathematics can be very theor theoretical and as long as it doesn't find the practical uh, pr practical uh, place to to give you some benefits it's still a theory right mm -hmm. and when i've learned about immudb because i joined the team uh, a few months ago um this was, this was this this moment that you find something that is working live database that you can ease easily use it and it has all this machinery behind it um, that is doing all these proofs and is uh, cryptographically verifying everything and keeps everything in place. So that's something for me that is a great benefit for, for basically uh, all of us, right? So previously we could think of this, right? Maybe there is a project that I want uh, to create and it would use this technology, but then I find it hard to implement this. And suddenly I find this kind of database 
where I have very easy interface and I can just take it and, and to use it. So for me, that's the major goal uh, of, of in projects like MUDB. So we have a lot of knowledge and actually majority of the cryptography and all these algorithms were invented a long time ago. And right now we only started implementing them and implementing them practically. Mm -hmm. and that's where I think MUDB uh, yeah, is, well, that's where the goal of the project is. Give people the way to use immutable database in a simple way. Okay, Hieronimo. Uh, yes, and uh, before uh, giving the explanation why, how I end up here, uh, but actually using MUDB is uh, for application developer is exactly the same as using a, a traditional database. You can download MUDB binary or docking con container and you will use like uh, any other key value store or SQL uh, database as well, right? So uh, before I joined Cognotary, I was working as a software engineer for IBM and the last project to um, um, digital right management and oh, that was related to applied cryptography there for generating the crypto materials and also uh, I was a contributor high College of Fabric um, by then and also I worked um, in a, a experimental project where we added SQL to high College of Fabric and we added a SQL support into the chain codes like actually in the smart contracts um, but by then I was convinced that uh, the complexity of the, the project was uh, quite big uh, for uh, there many there were many uh, com companies or organizations willing to use um, uh, blockchain just to be sure or to prove themselves or to the, their clients that the data was not changed. Uh, but then they had to run a very, very complex system. And uh, so I always thought about the possibility to have a, just a traditional database, uh, but with the verification possibilities. So to have the same uh, verification capabilities like a blockchain provide, but, but thought, thinking of single organizations having own, uh, being the owners of the data, but yet to to fulfill with auditory requirements or to prove to their clients that the data has not been changed. So uh, I, by then I started to think about this type of systems and, and, and I got to know about the company and the initial release of, of InmoDB. By then InmoDB was um, implemented using relying on another uh, Go and, and another key value store that was written in Go. Uh, so that's where I started to work. And related to uh, immutability, I think that tampering detection is one of the type of verification we can do. But there are many other things that we are um, uh, there to be explored or to be included. Uh, like how, what is the latest record that was modified? Um, so how to uh, being able to verify when you are um, dealing with higher level, uh, higher level data models like SQL, uh, if you have a database and you have a document like data model and, and you have queries and you have to verify that. So there, there is a lot of uh, things to, to yet to investigate, to explore and to, of course, to implement. Mm -hmm. So it's not lost on me. You mentioned blockchain. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Um, but let's, 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 uh, I do have a, uh, you piqued my curiosity when you, when you said that you support both, uh, SQL, you can use it both as a sort of traditional sort of RDBMS, you know, like SQL, um, database or, uh, um, as a key value store, uh, why the dual modality for, for, for accessing data? And actually everything starts as a log. So in MoDB is, it has a, um, a composite uh, construction and uh, everything embedded database. So we know we can be used as an embedded database that is a, a set of logs, a pen only log that is verifiable. It's like a, a transparency log. It's a, 
Um, so you can access one of the difference of a traditional key value store is that you can act, uh, give transaction by its ID, its unique ID. So you can, add, if you only need to store uh, records, logs, events, and then to query them, you, you don't need to query the data using an index, just directly using the, the entry. That is the initial, uh, the basic way of using it. Then we have the possibility to build a, an index based on the key. So because the tra every transaction or log entry consists of a list of key value entries. So then you can get what easily get, what are the transactions that modify this particular entry? And you will, of course, you will get the latest one, but you also can of kind of get the history of transactions that modify this, this particular key. And that is how we implemented temporary uh, uh, capabilities. So you can um, go back in time in the database and query the database as it was and, and without seeing newer changes. On top of this, we implemented SQL capabilities. Um, so the, the Every, every when you create an entry uh, in thinking in SQL, it end up being a, a, a transaction with that is a consists of key and value entries. So SQL, all, all the SQL changes or the SQL data model is backed by a key value uh, database. So actually the same transaction is what is happening. So we are using the key value transactions to store transactions that happen in SQL. So it's, uh, SQL was added afterward. So it's, it's possible to use both. Of course, they are isolated. Entries that are inserted uh, using the key value uh, are not uh, seeing the internal changes or the internal entries that are uh, when working with SQL. But both data models are possible. Mm -hmm. the, posi the, the advantage of using SQL, of course, is uh, it's easier to model your application because you, you have to think it's easier to work when for later on the find index for is efficiently querying the data um, for writing queries, of course. Um, but uh, we also added the possibility to verify in SQL. So that is one of the difference. So, so you can get a particular row based on the primary key and this entry will be. So you're so you're still able to model your application just like you would in a relational system. Um, exactly. It's just, it's just basically the the uh, um, the um, encrypted storage um, um, that is that is used in the verifiability once you pull data out um, all these things you're adding sort of on top of the sort of the, the good old model that that most developers who built a web applications and whatnot uh, are familiar with for example exactly okay okay so let's talk about the operability right uh, um, of this but before we jump into that I, I see John you've got a burning question you want to ask I don't have a burning question but I was gonna <laughs> say a like, question <laughs> the SQL stuff reminds me of the first time I ran into a use case where I didn't necessarily need an immutable database but I needed to mimic its functionality in some way um, basically I was working on like shipping stuff with addresses and everything and one of the things that came up were people were like, well, I want to be able to change these addresses I use to ship to things. Mm. And it became very clear that in a relational database, if you have a bunch of previous shipments that all associate with some record, and then you change it, then all of a sudden your history is really weird at that point because that's not actually what those shipments were. And like seeing a database like this, it's kind of interesting to, like, I think to, as developers, we encounter cases where immutable databases or something like that is useful. I mean, we all use package managers, which are another example of, like not really having immutability. You can release a version, but once it's released to some package manager, you're kind of stuck. You know, you have to release a new one essentially. Or you're supposed to be. <laughs> you're supposed to be. Like I mean, I don't want you to be able to change that. <laughs> I was just saying, most package managers won't let you do it. So I think as developers, we use immutable systems at times. But we kind of like forget about it. Because um, I think a package manager is a great example of something that really benefits from something where you can verify nothing got changed because that would be really bad when you're downloading third-party packages to like mm -hmm. not know for sure that that's still the same version. Um, but it's also like interesting in the sense that 
I feel like most systems we work with that use immutability have some sort of scapegoat. Um, the best mm -hmm. example I can give is uh, like Git. We always Git where you can have the history and it's supposed to basically be immutable, but there's always ways to force changes into like to rewrite history, which is not necessarily a great thing, but it's possible. So knowing that developers at some point want to like rewrite history and stuff, do they have to come into using MUDB like like they can't come into it, I'm assuming, with the same mindset of like I can use this exactly like a SQL database. So are there any like tips or advice that sort of like help them get out of that mindset that you see people struggling with when they're starting? So, so we are uh, continuing. Yeah, so so in IMDB what uh, what actually you could think of is that you can change the data, right? You can do corrections. But you, what you will still get, you have this auditability of the history. So it's like not lying to anybody that I did not make a mistake. I didn't make a mistake. I just corrected it. Right now, this is the state. But let me be clear. This is this is what we see. What we see. All right. This is the current state, and previously it was something different. And also, uh, there's this example with changing the address. I think this is a very, something very interesting because on the key value level inside a MUDB we have something like a reference to other key. So instead of getting some practical, some, some specific value, you just try to read it from other key and just forward it back. But what you can do is you can say that this reference is for that key at that transaction. So what it means is that it like freezes the value inside the history. So then you could create, a, let's say a record that there was this kind of shipment to that person uh, under that address at that point in time. So that is something unique. Um, yeah, also, I, I need to comment about one thing, uh, this uh, package managers. Um, <laughs> let, let me say that. Please we, do. <laughs> yeah, we, we, have, we have actually been using uh, this immutable databases, but we just don't know it or just forgot about this. And a very good example is actually GoMod proxy. Mm -hmm. So if, if there is, and actually the, the technology behind Gamut Proxy is very similar to what we have. It's this kind of immutable ledger. And I, actually we had the situation where we released some kind of tag, uh, some version of, of MUDB. And once somebody just fetches it through the proxy, it's set in stone. You, you cannot talk, change it. You cannot switch the tag to something else. And very weird situations happen then. And actually, this is for the security reasons. So if you release something, then everybody who downloads this particular version will only get this version of the code. You have to release a new patch version. And that's mm -hmm. actually good. And that's uh, that's yeah. a good about the security. So yeah. I, yeah. I agree that that's good. I guess I would imagine it would make adoption harder in the sense that developers are just weird about, like if somebody releases an invalid package and they want to pull it back real quickly, they're still weird about like, now I have to increment the version and they don't want to do that for whatever reason, mentally, they're like, I don't want to admit I made a mistake and Too show bad. that to people. <laughs> so like, does that make adoption harder when like yeah. you're basically forcing them to do that? In, in this case, in, in, in MoDB, uh, you have to convince every other client. <laughs> if you want to roll back the history in, in MoDB, you will have to convince every auditor or client that already have that register that state locally, right? That's the, the only, the only okay. option. Measure twice, cut once. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, but I think that's really making a mistake is, is not something huge and we all made mistakes. And in like in real life, there is always an option to correct. For example, yeah, like releasing, <laughs> releasing a package that contains some bug. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, right exactly. Right. And, mm -hmm. and and why why should we be ashamed of that? And actually, I see that uh, people who can say that they made a mistake and they corrected that, um, they tend to deal with those issues better than trying to hide it. So I would go that way. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I, I mean, I guess there are definitely cases where it makes sense to, to want to delete things. Like if you released uh, something on Git that had private keys, clearly you need to try to clean that up. But it's like, I, I agree with you that it is hard. Some Like, I don't know, people should be okay with mistakes, but I feel like in practice, people are weird with them. And there is actually a technical situation that could happen that there is a rollback. If 
in, in case of if you are using, let's say, a single master, a single node, and then it crashes and you cannot recover the data. Uh, so if you, the backup you, you have is old, and then older than the, that the client have, they will comply about that situation. So that is a situation that will happen and has to be taken into account. So the mistake will there will be having only one node or not having a backup. I think it's okay to admit mistakes. I mean, just mistakes are part of life. It's okay, you know. Just, just make it, make a new, you know, make a new thing and put that out there. And hopefully, people don't download your mistake <laughs> before you had a chance to replace it. Um, no, I, I do want to switch gears real quick to the operability um, aspect of things. Obviously, if one were to uh, find a use case for MUDB or really immutable databases uh, in general. Um, it's interesting the the as i was researching uh the technology i came across other things that i've come across before but didn't realize that's what they were like i came across um amazon's uh, um hyperledger no not hyperledger QLDB. QLDB. yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. i'm like hey that sounds familiar and, and then basically i started tracking basically the origin of these things why when did these things become popular um and there are references you know going back a few years but the, these types of technologies became very popular, I think, as in part as a result of an executive order that was issued um, uh, I don't know, maybe like a year or so ago uh, on cybersecurity and things like that. And, and there was mention of, of you know, producing uh, or having uh, things like a software bill of materials. And then I'm like, oh, hey, that's that's a that's I'm starting to hear more and more about that now. You know, there's like uh, um, advancements we've made, you know, with the shipping and packaging software and things like that. And, and all of a sudden, I'm sorry, these dots are connecting for me. Uh, you know about all these things that I read in the past and didn't really know what where did this thing come from kind of thing and 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 it, it, if, if for those listening in you know it's 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 interesting basically find the executive order it was issued it's called a cybersecurity something something it's basically you can find it on the white house.gov um, website or whatever but um you'll see like a like a this this mandate right with lots and lots of requirements for cybersecurity and everything else and you're going to find software built materials and stuff mentioned in there and whatnot and, and you can see how things like that, right, uh, um, are sort of a pushing forward the innovation that's happening in this space, especially with, you know, um, things like EUDB and whatnot. And, uh, and one of the things that that one of the use cases that that you're, you're um, basically uh, enabling, right, uh, or solving for is the whole sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, software, you know, basically verifying the content of a software package, right? So we just talked about how, you know, basically the GoMod proxy, right? Um, basically part of the thing that is also part, and in, in for those who, who, who basically when you download, when you download your modules and you see this weird go.sum file with all the you know, um, checksums in there and whatnot, that, you know, all these things sort of play a role, right? Into basically verifying, right? That the version of the, of the piece of software that you just got right is indeed right it's not gonna basically you're not gonna get a different version that has the same um, checksum right so all these things come together so to provide that sort of verifiability thing right so but i know one of those use cases that that you try to sort of uh, solve for head on right is this this, this sbom thing can you t take a, a little bit about that and then i want to talk about what is what it's like to actually run immunity in production yes yeah, so sbom so software build of material um is a term that is used to so let, let's say that you create a software and you create today you don't write all the software by yourself you just use external packages and when we look at uh, let's say don't js application it usually has hundreds of different dependencies and the same with golang right you don't write a http server by yourself you just take what in standard library and you do the same with uh, contributions for, from other people and software bill of material is basically describing that if we have this binary or this product what is it made of and uh, here we can actually use this immutable ledger because you just produce those assets those uh, mm, binaries once and we can identify them by say taking a hash uh, which is uniquely specifying this this specific binary and say that this consists of other components and those components also have this unique id maybe some kind of hashes so that means that if you change anything even a smaller bit um, you will get totally different binary and uh, you will you also have this uh, 
specific set of components that it was built from. And when you take uh, as software companies that are running this uh, kind of uh, binaries then, and then it turns out that there's one specific library that has vulnerability, how can you figure out where are those old components that are vulnerable? And uh, by just taking the software bill of material information, and by just scanning it, what is actually running in the production, you can very quickly identify vulnerable components and then this fix this. Because mm -hmm. there, there were attacks where actually until now, people may not, not know that their software that they are running is vulnerable. And this executive order is actually uh, uh, saying that you should have this software bill of material so that you can trace this information. Mm -hmm. And when it, we talk about ImmuDB and immutable ledgers, you can also store this information in a secure way so that uh, if it is persisted and database given you the proof, then you can rely on this information. You can rely on the fact that it was not changed. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because maybe there would be an attack that someone goes into your database and your production environment changes some kind of libraries and then attacks also the database that was that stores mm -hmm. information about this bill of material relations, the relations between packages, how you find this. And mm -hmm. immutability here protects you that uh, you can rely on this information. So so if we're talking about sort of uh, one of the recent um, vulnerabilities in Log4j, for example, that made, you know, basically the rounds a few weeks ago. Um, if I wanted to find out, okay, I'm running Java software, do, do am I running the, the version of Log4j that was, uh, that was susceptible to that vulnerability, right? With the software bill of materials, I can find out exactly, okay, do I have this specific version anywhere in my infrastructure, right? Um, yep. And then with the, something like ImmuDB, the the an attacker right um, that is leveraging you know the, this vulnerability couldn't go and change the software bill of material in in UDB right they, they couldn't they couldn't say they couldn't present they couldn't say you're not really running the vulnerable software by changing the software bill of materials in UDB because uh, um, um, you know you'd have to convince a clients that 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 wasn't true right or that or that change was true whatever it is they were changing. Yes, exactly, and actually that is what is uh, the base for the code notary. The, the mm -hmm. company that is uh, building ImmuDB, the, the base of their financial, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. base, that uh, there is this code notary cloud that is using ImmuDB to actually store this information, right? Mm -hmm. Because it looks like, uh, and even if we, uh, if there was, um, even if you don't have to, if you're not obliged to have the software bit of material, uh, then it's still good to have this information because mm -hmm. Log4j came out a few months ago and it, it was a very critical vulnerability where you could execute a code by just sending, in many cases, some packet to the server. Mm -hmm. And we know that there will be more, uh, more vulnerabilities like that in the future. So mm -hmm. it's better to right now be prepared and to start creating the software below materials. And when such vulnerability will happen, to quickly find it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool, cool. Um, very briefly, the does running ImmuDB is that is that process like uh, markedly different from say managing your traditional RDBMS or your traditional key value store? Um, if we can, if we can, if we can sort of level, if all things being equal, right? Do I have to do more or less than I would need to say run a, a Postgres server or so or a Redis server or something like that? Just run Docker image, or download binary and run it, and that's and it. Run it. Yeah, yeah, so that's the, the beauty of Go, right? <laughs> that's that's the beauty of right? Exactly. And, so, yeah. And depending on on the amount of data you are dealing with, uh, it will require some operational procedures like doing a compaction of the index. But there is some already. This is already implemented in ImmuDB, for instance. But this is for reducing the the space that is required for indexing because the index itself is an append only uh, data structure. So there is an operational procedure to to automatically compact the index. That is one of the things to take into account. Um, and the other is to, to be aware that you cannot fully the clients that are using ImmuDB. So if you try to revert to an older backup, the, mm -hmm. the clients uh, we comply about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I I am interested in in 
obviously understanding why you chose Go for this kind of work. Was there something you could have picked a different language? Um, was there something special about Go that made this kind of work uh, easier to approach? And so when, when I joined uh, uh, Code Notary team, actually, it was already written in Go. Oh, so <laughs> like you didn't have a choice. The decision was, was made before. But, but yeah. uh, the fact that it was written in Go is very important for me, actually. Because uh, yeah, I, I was watching Go for a very long time. I didn't initially. I didn't have a chance to work with this commercially, but uh, in, in my day-to-day -day job. But right now, uh, I see all the benefits that Go gives, like having those Go routines. I remember the C plus plus times when I was writing HTTP servers. First thing was that you had to write the HTTP server by yourself in many cases. But then dealing with all those threads and trying to schedule things and make you know keep things under control it it was doable and you could write a performance server but it took a lot of a lot of time so mm -hmm. golang is this uh, sweet spot between the efficiency of programming and still having the uh, performance uh, application in the end um so <laughs> i i think that it is a very good system and we know that google is using it and because they created the it so it must be bottle tested. It most likely contains this uh, knowledge about uh, large scale deployments that are built in because of where it is used. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it simplifies so many things that it's for, for me, it's a very good thing. And also, uh, Codentry is a startup company where the efficiency is also very important. So these things matter. So we could write, uh, let's say, something. Mm, faster maybe a little bit few percent in writing in in c plus plus c or, or even something lower but then it would take i don't know how many times Longer. more time maybe five maybe ten even mm -hmm. so cool what about you Geronimo? yeah exactly when i joined also uh, imodb was on the initial <laughs> release and it was already written in go but we cannot say that we have changed it, it Drast made drastic changes. Uh, so we didn't change the language, uh, but we could actually because um, by then we completely write uh, from scratch the storage uh, system. Before uh, in, in MIDB was using Butcher, uh, was, uh, yeah, Butcher DB, and that is another mm -hmm. key value store that is, mm -hmm. uh, is written in Go. Uh, but I think uh, it's a good choice for the reasons that Bar mentioned. I also like for the code uh, easy to read, the code readability. I found it very, very easy to read code and that is written in Goland. It makes it easier. And having a standard format for the code is one of the uh, reasons. And, uh, and that's it. I, uh, yeah, you, yeah, you seem pretty yeah. content with it. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's all there is to it. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Awesome. Good, you mentioned the formatting uh, of of Golang code because in C plus plus there was always a word, which one is better mm. and and what right. to choose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, nobody nobody loves Go font, but everybody loves Go font. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I I love it uh, since the first years. <laughs> I, I must say. John, you got you got one final question before we switch it over to unpopular opinions. I'm fine with jumping to unpopular opinions. <clears throat> there we go. It's that time. Ooh, hope you brought the goodies, gents. All right, let's 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 get the tune going. I actually think you should probably leave. So let's go with Geronimo first. What you got? Okay. Mine is not a technical one, uh, but during the pandemics, uh, I started to, to see that a lot of developers uh, started to upload photos uh, of the working environment outside, in a garden, in a beach. Uh, and for me, it's impossible. I, I don't know if it's just me, or those uh, photos are just illustrative, like uh, when you see a hamburger ad. <laughs> uh, so that will be, uh, I don't know if it's just me or... 
I mean, you've got a whole gym sitting there behind you. <laughs> yeah, that is actually this is related to what Bar may, uh, is going to mention probably. Uh, like, these people just I live my faces. <laughs> yeah, but in my opinion, in a second, <laughs> flowers and gardens behind them. I know, right? <laughs> but what once I I went outside uh, with my colleagues from the previous job uh, to to eat something, and we actually had some kind of alert and had to act very quickly, and we sat. Uh, somewhere just outside and honestly the lightning uh, makes it impossible to to do anything to see anything on, on the laptop so mm. i i kind of uh, agree with that so it's not that unpopular because i also agree <laughs> um, you have to have a good environment to to do work maybe in, in it's in indoor it's much better but outdoor it will be very hard i feel like every person's like unique in what they can and can't work with because mm. like some people love co-working spaces and I'm it's not that I hate them but like I would never want to go to one every day of the week for me I feel like I'd be less productive there where other people just thrive and the same with like coffee shops or any of that like I can't work in a coffee shop and I don't know if it's like my back or what but like if I'm working on my laptop all day where I'm like looking down it like eventually hurts my neck so like I have my monitor up higher and everything and I'm like I don't know how these people work all the time like sure i can do it occasionally but i can't do it all the time but i i literally know people who go to coffee shops most days of the week and i'm i don't know how they do it somehow they do so what's your unpopular opinion bart okay so my is yeah also about exercise maybe because mm -hmm. i think that as as it in general what we the mistake that we are doing is that we start limiting ourselves physically like you have monitor, so you work mostly with a head and hands and nothing else. It, so it's like the majority of your body is suspended while you work. And we are flesh and bones mostly when we <laughs> take the percentage <laughs> of ourselves. And what it means is that if, if you just shut down part of your body, the whole body would be less efficient. And it's a waste of I, resources. <laughs> yeah, waste of resources. And I was thinking that we approach this all in, in the wrong way. So why don't we, let's say, you know, have big keyboard when you can punch things, uh, like <laughs> use your muscles, and maybe it will increase your productivity. And just just think about all these genius, um, you know, uh, doctors in in our movies. Like they they all when they do something, they they do this with you no know, shouting and waving hands and things like that. And even if we read histories about some inventions in the past, they were not done while sitting. Mm. Maybe they were, but some inventions were done when, let's say, running after someone. <laughs> and I think that we are just limiting ourselves. And why, why don't we learn things like during studies, like, uh, I don't know, discussing projects uh, during the run? or maybe mm -hmm. swimming uh, and uh, solving computations in your head. Maybe this, this will increase our brain power. So if I understand you correctly, you are suggesting the outside working environment, but without taking the... <laughs> with you. It's like going yeah. to the beach without the computer. So, and yeah, running but... after random strangers. So you, you solve the problem <laughs> with lightning. You are solving the problem that they had with lightning. Yeah. If I understand it correctly, I assume he's saying that we should explore other ways of doing work that involve our body more, rather than right. like limiting ourselves to sitting at a keyboard. Right. Yes, exactly. But, but, but we if Jared still wants to summarize this as you should chase after people while you're coding. <laughs> we can do that too. We can do that too. We yeah, but that. Yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, John, did you bring one? I did not. You um, did not. You did not. Well, I can say I, I agree I... with Bart, though. Like, I, I like okay. the idea of thinking about other ways. Cause Johnny, you have a standing desk, don't you? Yeah. Uh, yes. It's uh, yeah. I can I can ra ra raise it up and and take it back down when I need to. So I used one of those for a while, and basically what I found was that I didn't like changing my setup all the time, and because I have mm. enough space in my house, what I ended up doing was just getting a desk that's always standing and putting a walking treadmill under it, and mm -hmm. I found that depending on like you can't do everything with it like it's hard sometimes to walk like walking three miles an hour while coding is not easy um like because mm. you stop to think and you're like pulling away from your keyboard and you're like whoa 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 <laughs> um so you have to like keep yourself going but where it is really useful is like 
if I'm watching talks from a conference or if I'm doing anything like that where mm -hmm. I don't really need to type as much or it's just light emails or something, I can sit there and actually like it allows me to sort of move my body while also thinking in a little different way. Mm -hmm. And it's an awesome way to get a break from just sitting through the day. But I, I think the unfortunate part is that most offices are like kind of limited on space. So it's not like you can throw everything you want in there. Mm -hmm. So it kind of limits right. that. But I do agree that it'd be nice to see people exploring more interactive ways to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, all right. All right. That's good. It's good. Um, I didn't bring an unpopular opinion, but I thought of one as we were having this, <laughs> this, <laughs> this little powwow. Uh, one thing we didn't get to talk about that, but that I am going to do a show on. So that's the unpopular opinion. I'm doing a show on blockchain um, at some point in the future. That's it. That's the unpopular opinion. <laughs> <laughs> It's dangerous opinion. Yeah, it's, it's, so yeah, your unpopular it's opinion is that you think you should do a blockchain show. I think I should do. Yeah, exactly. I think I need to do an episode on blockchain. Um, but yeah, that's that's gonna be unpopular. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's brutal out there, man. <laughs> I'm honestly curious if that's unpopular or just incredibly polarizing to the point that because there's definitely some people who agree with you doing a show on that. Like I can't imagine. I don't know. Right. How many well, I'm hope I'm hoping folks won't shoot the messenger. Right. I'm just the messenger. Look, I just, you know, I, I just I just don't want us to you know bury our heads in the sand and pretend this thing doesn't exist because clearly it pisses off a lot of people. <laughs> so, you know, let's just talk about it, right? Like we do most things. Let's just talk about it, and uh, you know, uh, if there are merits, um, we'll raise them, and if and if it's complete garbage, um, we'll show that too. So uh, yeah, um, um, we'll see how well that goes. Um, yeah, I, ho I hope. People don't boycott the show after that. But uh, yeah, we, we shall see. We shall see. All right. Let's wrap this up. Uh, I'm going to do a little outro thing. I think I'm supposed to do an outro. Is that is that what I'm supposed to do, John? I'm supposed to do an outro. All right. I'm going to do yes, an outro. Okay. And then we're going to stop the recording. And then we're going to allow our uploads to complete. All right. So here's the outro while we wave to our live audience. <laughs> Say bye to the live audience. Bye, live audience. Bye.